Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guests today are two colleagues from our History and Public Policy Program Editorial Assistant Peter Bierstecker and Program Assistant Keon Byrne. But today they join us in a different capacity. They are also the co-creators and co-hosts of a new podcast, International History Declassified. That's what we're going to be focusing on. Gentlemen, welcome. Thanks. Good to see you. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us. So uh, congratulations on the launch of the podcast. Tell us about it. What will you be focusing on? Peter, let's begin with you and then we'll hear from Keon. Sure, so this was a, uh, an idea that, that uh, grew out of our, our present situation, everybody at home um, wondering how we could still stay engaged and still uh, you know, deliver some of the most recent interesting historical research to our audience. Um, one of the ways that we thought about doing that with a little extra time on our hands nowadays uh, was to was to, do, to develop a podcast, which is something we had talked about for four years. Um, we're really in a unique position where we have um, 30 years of, of history as a, as a program uh, and a tremendous network of scholars and experts who, who we can call upon to, uh, to, to interview, to sort of ask about what their method is like, what their, what their um, experience is like, and, and um, hopefully learn a little bit more about the process of, of conducting history through the series. Keon, about that process, one of the terms that uh, is thrown around that I'm not sure if it's universally understood or jargon is sources and methods. Tell us about the sources and methods you'll explore. So we see this podcast as sort of a complement to some of our other work, uh, like the digital archive and our blog, which is actually called Sources and Methods. Uh, and we're hoping to use this uh, podcast as a way for Peter and I to sort of engage with the historians and learn how they find these sources and how they develop them, and then how they use those sources to create you know, the historiography of major events, uh, for instance, in this case, the Korean War. Uh, you mentioned the digital archive. For, for those unfamiliar with it, tell us what the archive is and how it can be found. So if you go to digitalarchive.org, uh, you can visit the Wilson Center and the History and Public Policy Program's digital archive, uh, where the, the title is pretty self-explanatory. It's an archive of different documents and collections from international archives. Um, we tend to focus on the post on the Cold War world, uh, a lot of East European documents, uh, but we do have a lot uh, from China, from Korea, uh, from the Middle East, uh, some from Latin America, uh, just basically covering as many bases as we can outside of the U.S. Peter, about that declassified part, uh, how often are new documents and new sources becoming available? They are constantly becoming becoming available, or at least becoming uh, discovered and uh, and accessed by by researchers. Um, as I mentioned, we have a, a wide network of, of scholars and experts who have have worked with our program over the last uh, twenty or thirty years, uh, and these are the people who are actually out in the field. These are the folks going to the Mo uh, archives in Moscow, in Beijing, uh, in in Warsaw, all around the world, um, who are actually conducting this research, and we're we're fortunate to you know provide them with uh, some support and, and avenues for publication. Uh, in return, we, we ask that they, they share their materials with us. They, they share whatever they discover so that we can make it uh, accessible to you know, people who are not able to, to travel to, uh, to Moscow uh, or, or to actually physically conduct our archival research. Um, so putting them up digitally, making them free to access. Uh, we have about 14,000 records currently, um, tens and tens of thousands of pages available for free, some of it translated into English from its original language, some original documents. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge on, on this resource. So uh, another thing that I've, I've learned about history from working with people like you in the HAP program and, and other historians I've interviewed over the years is that viewing history as some you know, done deal, static story that sits on a bookshelf is not the proper way to look at history. I've been surprised to find out just how dynamic it can be as the story changes, as new documents become available, as new research becomes available. I'm guessing that's something you're going to be illustrating through the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in talking with Sam, uh, Dr. Sam Wells and uh, Chuck Krauss of the HAP program, mm -hmm. um, it was very interesting to learn how the uh, discovery of new materials was able to impact our understanding. Uh, Sam actually referenced a couple of documents uh, that we have at, on the uh, digital archive, a couple of telegrams between Stalin and Mao and Kim that kind of reveal the thinking of these leaders in the decision to make the invasion. Uh, it's pretty fascinating uh, to see and to look back on some of the decision making and how our understanding of, of their thought processes changes with just one document. Um, 
for Sam, it was understanding whether the Truman administration was correct in sort of accelerating the military buildup with NSC-6. Uh, Chuck was discussing um, how a draft telegram that we had on the Chinese side that seemed to imply one thing uh, turned out not to be the final draft. So when it was discovered in the Soviet archives, uh, we found that actually they had not sent the telegram as we had it, and it completely altered our, our um, understanding of their thinking. And I should mention for the benefit of our viewers and listeners, what Keon was referencing is that uh, the first three episodes uh, focus on the Korean War. We happen to be recording this discussion on June 25th, which is the day that the war started 70 years ago. And so um, more about some of the things you learned, you mentioned Sam Wells' is, uh, the impact of the Korean War, or, or, or Sam Wells's book on these, this research, and then you interviewed him for, I think, is that episode three? Is that correct? That'll be our second episode. Episode two. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you about, because uh, I know for, I got to interview Sam about his book as well, and I know that one of the cases he makes is about uh, how the Korean War essentially is an escalation of the Cold War, or becomes an escalation of the Cold War. Would you explain that concept? And I'm guessing that's part of what's covered in your interview. So, so that's definitely a, a central thesis of, of Sam's book. Uh, he, he sees the, uh, the impact of the Korean War as taking the, uh, the Cold War from what was a political economic conflict at that point uh, to becoming a superpower uh, arms race afterwards uh, with the development of, of uh, Soviet and Chinese uh, and nuclear weapons around the, the period. This was a, a massive escalation. Um, there was also a, a misconception on, on the US side, which uh, Sam spoke to and, and uh, Chuck echoed as well, which was that, uh, you know, the, the Truman administration, some in the administration just did not fully understand the vast resources that were being expended uh, by, the, by the other side in support of the North Korean regime. Um, and that was uh, something that, that was discovered in, in research. The fascinating thing for me is I think, you know, for, for nearly 40 years after the end of the, end of the Korean War in the mid-50s, uh, almost all of the history, uh, at least the history books that you and I and Keon grew up reading were primarily driven by Western sources. Uh, at, at this mm -hmm. point, that was not easily for US academics, for Western academics to, to go into the archives in, in uh, places like Moscow or Beijing. Uh, but that, that all changed, uh, as I mentioned, about 30 years ago uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and, and the first uh, delegation of, uh, of academics, actually, from the Woodrow Wilson Center um, who, who went to who went to Moscow and, and first started going after these documents. So since the, the past 30 years, we really had a much more, a much fuller picture of, of the history of the Korean War, an international uh, history of, of it. When that more rounded view occurs, uh, does it tend to be shades of gray or can it dramatically alter how we view events? Uh, I suppose it depends on the event. Um, I think, uh, we were talking with Sam about whether there will be any sort of new earth shattering information that comes out in our understanding of the Cold War and, and the Korean War. And he seemed to believe that that's likely not gonna happen and, and Sergei as well. Um, but it does, uh, rather than uh, creating shades of gray, it kind of provides more color. It kind of provides a little bit more information, a little bit more depth into our understanding. And it helps us uh, frame the thinking of, of these leaders, not just at the time, but also moving forward and how these countries perceive uh, these major events um, now. Uh, one of the things we talked about with Sergei was uh, why is the Korean War so overlooked today, both in the US and Russia? And I think part of that is, is looking into their thinking back then and understanding, as Pete mentioned, the resources that are being invested on either side. Um, it's certainly China and Korea, uh, both Koreas who suffer the most during this war and therefore are the most invested in it and have the strongest memory of it today whereas uh, the Russians and the U.S. Um, more or less overlook it as, as uh, one of the you know, seminal events of the Cold War and of the 20th century. In one of your episodes, you mentioned Sergei Radchenko. The, he, he talks about the notion of trying to get inside Stalin's head. Uh, and and I, I think of things that in, in American history where, say, the Nixon tapes or recordings of LBJ, which gave us this almost startling view of these real people uh, versus these iconic historical figures. But in the case of someone like Stalin, a, a private figure then, a private figure remaining so, even with the declassified documents? Uh, yes, I, I certainly think that's the case. And that's really why um, we were so interested in, in speaking with somebody like Sergei. Um, 
Kian and I are not are not subject matter experts on the on the Korean War. We we've not done you know dissertations on this topic. Um, obviously, in our work at the at the Wilson Center, we've uh, stumbled across plenty of publications, uh, helped to organize events on the on the the topic. But um, we we go into this very much as non experts. We we want to we want to try to get information from the experts. We really want to try to um, you know pick their brains and and find out about what they're doing. Uh, because it's interesting to us, because it's fascinating, and, and um, folks like Sergei, who have spent so much time in in every archive in Moscow, basically, um, are, are really uniquely positioned to to be able to answer these kinds of questions that folks like Kian and I uh, would have. Peter, the way you describe that, it sounds as if uh, you want this to be accessible to non-historians. You don't have to be an aficionado; you can just follow the trail, and anyone with a curiosity will find the material interesting. So I think we're going after what we're what we're calling the uh, history enthusiast crowd, um, not necessarily uh, complete uh, uh, not lack of knowledge, uh, total of non-experts, but um, people who appreciate good history, uh, interesting history, and are, are curious about um, how how it actually gets made. Um, John, we, we've taken actually a lot of inspiration from your from your now series. You always ask, or you often ask uh, one question of of many authors, which is. What is the process like? How does the sausage get made? And that's the thing that's that's uh, absolutely of interest to Kian and myself uh, in terms of, of understanding how these historians complete their work and 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 uh, and discover what they discover in their research. Yeah, well, well, like you, I'm I'm always been fascinated by that. And to be completely honest, total transparency here on Wilson Center. Now, I often ask interviewers or, or authors that question with the hope that they can reveal some shortcut to writing a book. And what I found is, unfortunately, it doesn't exist. All their sources and methods are different, but the same thing applies in each case. They do the work. They do the work. Mm -hmm. But they Hopefully the work is fun along the way. <laughs> there you go. At, at best case scenario. If you don't have a publisher <laughs> breathing down your, your neck with a right. deadline. Give us, gentlemen, give us some preview of what you have planned for the future. If you do, you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot. I know you have uh, three episodes out there, uh, all with this focus on the 70th anniversary of the Korean War from different perspectives. W give us a, a preview of your production planning. What can we look forward to? So um, we envisioned the, the first three episodes as sort of a single block and something to work from and, and sort of develop our methods. Um, I think moving forward, one of the things that uh, I know I particularly found interesting, and I think Pete did as well, um, was our discussion with Sergey about kind of the future of international history. Um, I think one of our goals in this and sort of uh, increasing our engagement uh, for the digital archive for sources and methods and, and for the field in itself um, trying to understand uh, how the sausage is made and how the sausage is going to be made for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, we were uh, very interested in looking to um, kind of explore some areas that our own work has not uh, covered so far. So one of the things that we're hoping to get into is sort of conversations on uh, civil rights in the Cold War and sort of um, the development of international history looking outside of the great powers. Um, the Korean War, a lot of our work has centered around uh, China, Russia, the United States, um, but we wanted to sort of um, start exploring some areas where we don't have as much archival evidence, we don't have as much experience, and uh, where the perspective is really missing. So um, that's sort of our general next plan. I think we'll see how these uh, few episodes are received, maybe tweak some things, and then uh, we'll, we'll kind of sit down with the rest of the program and sort of decide exactly uh, how we want the next few episodes to turn out. Any, any thoughts uh, you want to share on the future, Peter, in addition to what we just heard from Keon? I think Keon, <clears throat> pardon me, I think, uh, I think Keon summed it up pretty, pretty well there. One of the things that I, I've always found interesting and, and something that has been a bit of a, um, not, a not a gap in our, in our work, but, but something that we've perhaps not focused on as, as much as uh, sort of international history, high level diplomatic history is social history of the Cold War. Uh, and there's some some really fascinating uh, topics being researched on this on this uh, and, and interesting archives being used. So from my perspective, I would like to, to see us uh, dip our toes a little bit more into those into those pools of, of experts and, and hear um, a different perspective on on uh, Cold War history. One final speculative thought before we close. Now I want to welcome you to the club of interviewers now that you're officially part of the club. And one of the, <laughs> well, you, you've been ordained. <laughs> one of the uh, questions that you always get, I always get, and I know everyone who's ever conducted interviews gets is your favorite interview of all time or 
the, the, the dream interview or interviews who you'd love to book if you could. Uh, looking ahead, uh, anybody on that, that hit list that you would love to have sit mm. down and be a part of uh, International History Declassified? There are a couple of names on a, on a short list that I've, I've developed, um, which, it, you know, I have to admit include a couple of, you know, favorite, favorite former college professors of mine who, who have been sure. very important in the field. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, I think, I think honestly, the, the one I'm, I'm most excited for is the one that I don't know anything about right now. The one that I, that's not even on my radar. The one that's going to be um, a, a cool book or a cool uh, topic that we stumble across and, and uh, manage to have an engaging and, and fascinating half hour conversation with this. Peter, I'm writing down your answer. I'm going to steal that because I, I usually don't have a good answer to that question yeah. that I just asked. And Keon, how about you? You can't use um, Peter's answer. I'm sorry. Well, I was gonna I was gonna use a variation on on Pete's, which is uh, we actually have uh, a couple of people that we're hoping to reach out to in the next couple of weeks, but I don't want to call them out on the uh, on the sure. uh, interview today. That's um, a little pressure. Yeah, but uh, I mean, there, honestly, um, there are a lot of people in our network that I'm you know really excited to sit down with. Some people that we've met and we know pretty well, and uh, we know that are fun to talk to, and some people that. Uh, we would like to get to meet and get to kind of explore their own work. So um, I have a few people, my interest is in the Middle East, and I also have some people that I'd like to kind of use this as an excuse to, to get to know a little better. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, as you mentioned, three decades of work, you have lots of a, a large network to tap into globally. So we're very excited for you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on the podcast with us today. And look, we look forward to seeing what you have. Great. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And I should tell our viewers and listeners, too, that if you'd like to uh, subscribe to International History Declassified, or at least just give it a listen, it's available in all those places where podcasts are available and where you listen to your favorites. And also, as a fallback, you can always visit wilsoncenter.org and visit the History and Public Policy page, and you'll find links there as well. Again, Keon, Peter, thank you for joining us, uh, and best of luck with the project. Thanks Thanks, to everyone. Sorry, I'm sorry. Step on your on your gratitude. Uh, (laughs) And when I thank our viewers and and listeners as well, and hope that you'll join us again soon for another edition of Wilson Center. Now, until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.